mostly. Those are the symptoms of the infection on Mother Base. The blisters on the body were full of tiny worms. Parasite larvae, most likely. But we couldn't find any adults. It doesn't seem to mature in the body, like a sparganum. We don't know the root of infection, or what causes symptoms to develop. The infection rate, along with the number of dead, are both on the rise. If we don't find the cause, and soon. Boss, do you remember seeing these symptoms before? The bodies floating around in the oil facility? The bedridden test subjects at the Devil's House? This epidemic looks just like what we've seen on our hunt for Cypher. It could be a counterplay by Skullface. That's insane. You mean they weaponized parasites? Parasites as weapons. That definitely falls under the Biological Weapons Convention. But it's something the world would never see coming. And no one's ever developed a vaccine for parasites. So this is the weapon of mass destruction Cypher was working on in Africa? It may be. But if it is, how did the yellow cake and walker gears fit in? There must be something bigger we're not seeing. Anyway, our priority now is to prevent more casualties. The medical team is studying the infection, but we can't treat anyone until we know the root cause. All we can do right now is halt the spread of infection. Remember before, boss, when Quiet attacked one of our guys on Mother Base, stuck a knife in his mouth. He's one of the very few soldiers who've had contact with her recently. Close contact. I don't think it's a coincidence that he was among those who became symptomatic pretty early on in this epidemic. Saliva and blood spatter, an open wound, mucosal infection. Whatever is causing this got inside him then. Miller, that is a baseless accusation. The source of the infection is quiet. Everyone suspects her. We don't know that. And we've come across these symptoms before. The bodies in the water at the oil field facility. Those sick people in the beds at the Devil's House. They're identical to what we've seen while we've been after Caution. Cypher. Rain. The infection Caution. could have come from elsewhere. But at the very least, she does know something. <laughs> it's not like she's gonna talk. No, not through words, anyway. But what about her actions? Quiet held a knife to that soldier back then, before he became symptomatic. There must have been a reason for that. A reason for shoving a knife down the throat of one of our men. What if she's capable of identifying who's infected? What if she was trying to stop the infection but couldn't communicate that to us? The answer to that, the source of the infection, might be in the mouths of the infected. You think there's some kind of clue in their mouths? I don't know. But maybe there's something about the mouths of those who've become symptomatic, something in common. Something their mouths have in common. Forget it. We can't trust her. Even if she can spot the infected, I don't want her help. I understand how you feel. But this is something to go on. Can't you see it's just like I said? Bringing her here was a big mistake. Quiet is gonna be the end of us. Stand down. You've got zero proof. Try to keep an open mind on this, boss. There has to be a way to identify who's infected. You mentioned that the man on fire was crushed under Sahelanthropus in its hangar. Yeah. He was caught under the wheels of its transport platform. Mm. But his body wasn't found. What? We searched the area the moment we arrived, but there was no trace of him. I wasn't hallucinating. I know. I trust you on that. That means someone must have taken the body. But when I got there, everything was still as it was. Even Skullface hadn't been touched. I can't see a reason to sneak into a place like that and drag out the biggest, heaviest guy there. What are you getting at? The only option left is... He got up and walked away. That platform ran him over. Just ran him over. You're saying that's not enough? I don't want to believe it, but... Maybe not. He shrugs off bullets, even rocket strikes. There's no reason to think that would finish him. It seems ridiculous, but... I'll start gathering eyewitness accounts, just in case. If you dig up anything concrete, I want to know. You'll be the first, if I dig anything up. But I hope to hell I don't. No kidding. Volgan, the Gru Colonel, was burned alive with a Shagoha during Operation Snake Eater 20 years ago. 
Despite suffering severe burns to his entire body, he still clung to life. After you left Seleniarsk, Volgan's body was taken to a research institute in the outskirts of Moscow. But modern medicine couldn't explain why he was still alive. Not that the Colonel was any ordinary man to begin with. That constant electric current he had running through his body that he could unleash at will? To be honest, I was always uncomfortable around him. Thought I might get electrocuted just by standing nearby. The Institute studying him was tasked with investigating and developing human paranormal abilities. The comatose Volgan was used to further the Soviet Union's research into such abilities. But not long ago, the facility burned to the ground. And Volgan's body was never found among the rubble, even though the fire started in the room where they were keeping him. This occurred at around the same time you woke up. If Skullface was right, and a thirst for revenge can turn a man into a demon and keep the dead alive, then this man on fire who's been coming after us ever since you woke up, well, that just might be what's left of our old friend Volgan. It's not over yet. Back in 64, in Selenuarsk, you brought his plans for a utopia down in flames. That grudge is what's keeping him alive. The day the research facility holding Volgan burned down, a Soviet jumbo passenger jet happened to crash nearby, far away to the north of that hospital in Cyprus. On board the plane was a young boy who was being studied at the same facility. The plane fell to Earth from over 8,000 feet, but the boy's body was the only one not recovered. At almost exactly the same time as the crash, Volgan awoke in that facility. According to the Research Institute's documents, the gifts this boy demonstrated included psychokinesis and telepathy. To protect his mind from being inundated with other people's thoughts, he always wore a kind of gas mask. A rudimentary form of psychic insulation, apparently. We don't know where this boy is, but if Skullface is connected to him, we may cross paths with him yet. This boy is part of a new age, where nothing we understand about the world makes sense anymore. Don't let your guard down. About the pathogen spreading through Mother Base, you've seen everything we've got on the outbreak. What's your opinion? Textbook symptoms. A vocal cord parasite infestation. And judging from this casualty list, it is the Kikongo strain. Meaning... A breed of parasite that triggers symptoms upon detecting pronunciation specific to Kikongo. So our Kikongo-speaking staff are at risk? Quite so. Hmm. Huh. He's right. All the victims do speak Kikongo. So they can survive if they just use another language? There is no guarantee you're only dealing with a Kikongo strain. Other language strains may be present. You well know he was teaching them languages from all over the world. The Devil's House. In Zoya Badia Bulu. There is no way to know how many strains he has at his disposal. So how do we keep them from becoming symptomatic? You mentioned using microbes. Use this. A type of Volbachia. Introduced to a sample of the parasite. Wolbachia. A parasitic bacteria that colonizes the parasites. Turning male to female. And preventing copulation. You must cultivate more. What have you done with the infected bodies? Cremated to stop the spread of infection. But we did keep a few for study. Good. Take this sample. Grind it to a pulp and introduce it to the larvae now nesting in the dead. The Volbachia will multiply rapidly within those larvae. They're soldiers, not some petri dish. Conventional cultivation methods will take too long. Extract the Volbachia from those larvae and vaccinate your men. Kikongo speakers first. This is the fastest, surest way. No one is to speak a word of Kikongo until the Bobakia are safely inside them. 
I will instruct your medical staff in detail on site. You have the appropriate facilities. Yes, but do not worry. I made a pact with your bit de Holone on the honor of the Dene. I speak no lies. Keep an eye on him. Will do. Follow me. I'll take you to the medical team. Now, we must wait for the Volbachia to multiply in the larvae. How is the disease transmitted? If it's carried by insects or rodents, then... There is no intermediate host. So... The vocal cord parasites lay their eggs in the larynx of the host. Most hatch and migrate to the lungs. But some are transported to the mouth through ciliary movement. Mixing in with saliva. Saliva. Droplet transmission. Sneezing, coughing. Any food or water containing infected saliva. It would spread fast. Indeed. And when the larvae migrate to the lungs, symptoms can resemble the early stages of a cold, making it easy to infect others. Meaning a simple conversation would be enough to pass it on. All right, so what happens after the larvae migrate to the lungs? It is as I said before. They mature by feeding on alveolar tissue. It is only then that noticeable symptoms appear in the host. And by that point, it's too late. He's infected everyone else. It's one hell of a weapon you've created. That is what Blag Anna wanted. Something that would spread easily. <sighs> in truth, he's not the reason. But we will discuss that another time. The Walbachia have multiplied. We're preparing to extract them and begin vaccinating. But is this really the only way? Sure, it'll prevent infection, but the cost... You would rather remove their vocal cords? No. Tactical communication's a linchpin of what we do. What if we were to ban the use of Kokongo? Insufficient. First, there is no guarantee that only the Kikango strain is here. Second, there is the matter of how the parasites lay their eggs. Before they can copulate, they must be exposed to the pronunciation of a specific language for a period of time. Like a container filling with water. But the duration between when the container is full and when the copulation actually begins varies from case to case. In other words, even if the infected stops speaking as a countermeasure, it may already be too late. The only true solution is to prevent copulation through the obakia, or by physically removing the affected tissue. Yeah. Do any anti-parasitics work? It sounds as though you have already tried. Yeah. We tried everyone there is, and nothing. I have yet to find a medicine that can remove the parasites. At best, it temporarily covers their ears. Why is that? Because the parasites are... companions to us. To remove them inevitably harms the host. Companions? More than you think. And this is why the human immune system cannot eliminate them. We've inoculated the staff with Walbachia to keep them from becoming symptomatic. Hmm. That should also contain the infection. How did this happen in the first place? It has to have been a cipher spy within our ranks. If this is so, then why the Kakango strain? If their intent was to wipe you out, Skullface said the remaining English parasite was close to the boss. If this latest strain was his doing, he wouldn't have tipped his hand. It is possible someone brought eggs onto the base. Without knowing. Stuck to their shoes. Clothing. Well, that makes the most sense to me. And where did the eggs come from? You mentioned that your boss visited Nzoya Badiopulu. 
sure. But his gears disinfected immediately upon return. Hmm. Then he was not the carrier. And not just the boss. All staff dispatched to high-risk regions were quarantined on the flight back. When the symptoms first appeared, we checked and disinfected all equipment used up to that point. Any and all prisoners, soldiers, materials, and animals extracted during missions were also quarantined. So, that just leaves. I have seen children around here. Where are they from? All over. Some were being held hostage at a mine. Then there were the troublemakers at Bwala Yamasa. Bwala Yamasa? Yeah. Their clothes, their things. Did you burn them? They're just kids. We couldn't. And besides, not one of them's shown symptoms. The parasites don't infect prepubescent hosts. Their vocal cords are not fully developed. Well, if infection doesn't occur in children... It is possible they carried eggs on their clothes, and the infection spread from them. Check the kid's stuff. I doubt there is any trace left by now. But if there is, some of those kids must be close to hitting puberty. How could we have missed this? The name Bwala Yamasa got quite a reaction from you. I'm guessing the Kakongo strain was released in that village. Cypher used that region to experiment with vocal cord parasite transmission. The Kakongo strain. The settlements around the refinery upstream of Bwala Yamasa were the proving grounds. They would infect one villager and record transmission speed. Dangerous work. If they failed to contain the infection, it would slip into the surrounding regions. At which point the world found out about the parasites, making them useless as a weapon. Incredible they'd risk such a thing. The test site was densely populated too. A terrible place for such experiments. No doubt, they thought burning everything would wipe away all traces. The settlements were covered in oil anyway. Who would wonder if one day they caught fire? And so it did. They burned it all, living and dead. Those remains. But they miscalculated. Transmission speed was far faster than anticipated. It may have been the temperature, or hygiene standards. Or perhaps the parasites reacted quickly to Kikongo. Whatever the reason, nearly all villages were swiftly infected, and the settlements reduced to mounds of corpses. Making matters worse, the dry season was ending. When it came time to burn the village, the Moneni River had swelled. Many of the bodies were waterlogged. Meaning they didn't burn completely. The corpses still contained viable eggs, and the larvae washed downstream. And when the people downstream drank that water... That marked the end for Bwala Yamasa. I learned all of this at the mansion. I warned him of the risk of eggs getting out. And? We are prepared for any eventuality. I get it. Mm. Putting the oil field back online. The oil leaks, saner. They planned to pollute the river, prevent the spread of infection. But the oil flow was stopped, and downstream the people of Masa village started using the water again. The PF soldiers deployed at the village were locals, spoke Kikongo. They were infected, and the kids survived. I've heard enough. And who stopped the flow of oil? Don't. We did. <sighs> that confirms it. The source of the Kikongo strain infection was Masa village. And the children brought it here. It is no one's fault. There is no blame to be cast. The parasites. They were tested in other regions? Their physiology requires that they be tested under varied conditions. Another test site was in Afghanistan. 
So it was the parasites there. Both the Pashto and Tajik languages are spoken in the mountains of Afghanistan. And population density is low. Ideal testing grounds for how accurately the parasites target only the specified language. It is also relatively easy to prevent the spread of infection. And the results? The first test, I am told, was a success. Once the Pashtun Mujahideen were infected with the Pashto strain, they were all but wiped out. The Hamid fighters is Marseille Fort. It was doubly successful. No Tajik Mujahideen or Soviet soldiers became symptomatic. So the parasites proved to be effective. What about the second test? Also supposedly a success. A Pashtun village was the target. However, the original aim was to obtain samples of the infected. In this, they failed. And the village? The Soviets enacted a standard scorched earth operation. That must have been the village where Malak lived, before being held captive at Lamarhate Palace. Having had more time to think on it, the details shared with me may have been false. They are madmen who would do anything to cover up the truth. They certainly seem to like tossing their problems in the fire. As a boy, Skullface's life went up in flames. Perhaps that is what fuels his fixation with fire. Your Wolbachia stopped the infection all right, but I still don't get it. How can a few bacteria change males to females? I know they're only bugs, but... It is not such a rare thing in the natural world. Many insects and nematodes are infected with Wolbachia. But why? They nest in the cell cytoplasm of the host, even in the egg cells, with the result that the offspring are born infected. Mother-to-child transmission. However, Wolbachia cannot nest in sperm because they do not have cytoplasm. So even a successful infection of a male ends after a single generation. This means the Volbachia must resort to maximizing the population of infected females. Sounds like an ethnic cleansing campaign on a tiny scale. Gender change from male to female is their survival tactic. So more females means more Volbachia carriers so it can keep thriving in the following generations. But the parasites in a human host are supposed to be a mating pair. If there's no male, there'll be no offspring at all. It's killing itself. Slow down. This tactic is intended for environments where a single male can copulate with multiple females. Originally, the Wolbachia did not infect the vocal cord parasites. I created a mutated strain, modifying the Wolbachia so that it could infect monogamous pairs. The Wolbachia's greatest multiplying tactic, the male-to-female change, worked against itself in the monogamous parasites. Just as you said, then I performed repeated selection of Wolbachia strains until I achieved a 100% certainty of male-to-female conversion. Creating female-female pairs, unable to reproduce. And you say the Wolbachia affects the host of the host, that is, us, cutting off our means to reproduce? It is almost certain. Of course, we will not turn female. After all, mammals possess no natural gender-changing function. But some Wolbachia strains can cause cytoplasmic incompatibility in the host. Is that some cell deformity? Put simply, it means the altered sperm of infected males kill the female's egg on contact. And that's happened to us? Yes. And yet, what occurs in humans is not just simple CI. 
To date, there are no cases of Volbachia affecting humans. Hmm. The fact that this strain causes this effect. Is it the vocal cord parasite's affinity with humans? Hmm. I do not know enough to say for sure. So the parasite warps the host. Reminds me of what Skullface said. It is the way of all organisms to create their own optimal environment. Just look at you and this base. Organisms that cannot do this are doomed to extinction. The difference with parasites is that their environment is another organism. That creates a connection between life and life. Parasitism, symbiosis, or death. In this way, the hose too is challenged to adapt. So what were they doing at Enzoya Badia, Balu? That facility with all the people laid out in rows? The abandoned factory Shibani was held in. It is precisely as you guessed. Black Anna was coding languages into the vocal cord parasites. They infected the subjects with the parasites, then made an incision in the throat to expose the vocal cords. That allowed them to play recordings of a desired language directly to the parasites. And the parasites learned the languages that way. That's some teaching method. I just don't get how a bunch of bugs had the brain power for it. They don't. Do not judge them by human standards. They do not learn as a function of intellect. Then how do they do it? What language the parasites react to is coded into their genes. You could expose the Japanese strain to English for years, and it would never learn the language and react to it. The pronunciation, rhythm, and structure are different. But what about, say, Spanish and Portuguese? Linguistically, the two are very close. Yeah, they're both Ibero Romance languages. Even so, a Spanish language mating pair exposed to Portuguese will not copulate. Only when they hear Spanish. Only then. And the majority of their offspring will be the same. So it's a literal case of a mother tongue. But if that's so, I don't see how the different strains can be created in the first place. Well, among the many thousands of offspring, there may be just a few that react to Portuguese. You're talking about mutations. Correct. Playing the tapes helps to identify the mutant strains. Those specimens are then isolated and bred with one another. From their children, specimens that react more strongly to Portuguese can again be selected and bred. Repeating this process creates a strain that reacts solely to Portuguese and never to Spanish. Mutation and selection. No different to breeding roses. So you kept increasing the change over the generations, adapting them to languages from all over the world. It must have taken a hell of a lot of patience. More like patience. Just how many died for this? There's something I still don't get. In order to tell which larvae will react to Portuguese, you'd have to let them develop and then see which copulate. That means you'd need tens of thousands of guinea pigs. There's no way you could do that in a facility that small. For normal selective breeding methods, you would be right. But there is a more effective selection method when training the vocal cord parasites. <sighs> Go on. It is not only when mating that the parasites listen for language. Shortly before hatching, larvae display markedly increased activity in reaction to particular language. The active eggs can be identified under a black light. So the eggs that react to Portuguese are selectively placed in the throats of subjects. So you see, Narrowing down strains that react to the target language is an effective process. 
Though I'm sure that even so, many lost their lives to create the various strains. Taken against their will into that... Crushing that dungeon. The there are two reasons for playing the tapes for the parasites. One, to isolate the eggs that respond to the target language. And two, to cause the specimens raised from the selected eggs to mate. I get how the system works. But why do they respond to language before they even hatch? It's not like they can mate from inside an egg. It is because the larvae learn the language before hatching. You mentioned that what language the parasites respond to is hard-coded into their genes, and that they don't have the brain power to actually learn a language. But then you say that the larvae at Nzoya Bulu were learning the languages in the egg. Your story doesn't add up. Your country is home to a unique songbird. The Japanese bush warbler. Sure, what of it? What a beautiful call it has. But no bush warbler can sing it perfectly at the start. As chicks, they can barely chirp at all. They must learn from their parents and other adult birds. Only then can they sing properly and attract females. So naturally, there are individual differences in each bird's call. Though they start on the same footing, each bird is influenced by its teachers. And the parasites are the same? Like the birds, the parasites have a genetic predisposition towards a particular language. But while in the egg, the larvae's ears are tweaked by listening to the voice of the host. This tweaking ensures that the grown parasites will react better to the host's speech pattern. Why would they have an ability like that? Well, there are distinct regional differences within even the same language. Rare is the language that has no unique dialects. Yes, learning the host's speech pattern before hatching attunes the larvae to whatever twist of pronunciation it will encounter. This adaptive ability is what makes them so formidable. I see. So a language requires selective breeding, but the parasites can learn dialects by themselves. Of course, having the egg stage larvae listen to the tapes in the factory was not meant to teach them. It was more important to use that trait of theirs to identify the mutated strains. As I mentioned earlier, is that really accurate enough to use as a weapon? You could wipe out a neighboring ethnic group by accident if their pronunciation is too close. What you say is true. In that sense, they are imperfect as ethnic cleansers. But for his purposes, they are good enough. His objective was not to exterminate any one ethnic group, but to render the world's lingua franca, English, inert. About this OKB-0 Emmerich was talking about. Its location and features match the citadel in the mountains northeast of the Soviet base camp. Built during the time of Alexander the Great, it was left in ruins following one of Genghis Khan's campaigns. Its occupants changed time and again due to war, and it was expanded on more than one occasion. Ultimately, it fell into the hands of the Soviet philosophers. The Soviet army was using it as the headquarters of its Afghan invasion force. But it would seem that Skullface's connection with the philosophers gave him license to develop Sahelanthropus there. And that's what Emmerich was doing at the place before he got the axe. But OKB is a designation the Soviets use for weapon design bureaus. There's no way they'd have one of those in Afghanistan. And in principle, the numbers that follow OKB are always integers above one. There is no zero. Perhaps this was a secret facility of the Soviet and Chinese philosophers dating back prior to World War II. Though it's more likely Skullface just picked a fake name that more or less fit the Soviet's pattern. It doesn't go there often, but he sure as hell won't miss this. They use the heliport on top of the tower for his visits. Start by heading for the heliport. 
Then wait for your chance to make contact with Skullface. It seems Sir Holanthropus's armor is made from depleted uranium. That offers some serious protection. The U.S. military is planning on using it for its main battle tanks, too. Maybe that's where Emmerich got the technology. Uranium? They're using nuclear fuel for armor now? No. What they use for nuclear fuel is uranium-235, which is extracted from natural uranium. Depleted uranium is a byproduct of that process. Sort of like the leftovers, I guess. The garbage. Uranium-235 makes up 0.72% of natural uranium, whereas depleted uranium contains only 0.2%. What are the benefits of using it for armor? It's a pretty short list. Uranium's a heavy metal, like lead, meaning it can hold a greater amount of kinetic energy. But it also boasts a hardness closer to tungsten that makes it an ideal material to use for, say, armor-piercing ammunition penetrators. But it's not the best choice for armor. Its volume is less than that of ceramics, but for an equal weight, you could end up with less protection. So why use it then? According to Emrick, it came down to him being unable to source ceramics technology from a manufacturer. Plus, given that it's an upright walking vehicle, he wanted to reduce the bulk of certain areas. Despite all that, depleted uranium still makes for some tough armor, and Emmerich says it's been proven in live fire tests. It stops most Soviet tank shells. Emmerich didn't go with depleted uranium for Sahelanthropus's armor because of its strength. He had nukes in mind. Exactly. It's meant to use its body as the fuel component for a nuclear weapon. Sahelanthropus uses built-in uranium enrichment Archaea to melt its own body and extract uranium-235 from the depleted uranium in its armor. Those Archaea perform the enrichment in an extremely short time. The concentration jumps by a factor of several hundred, from 0.2% to over 90%, the end result being highly enriched weapons-grade uranium. Sahelanthropus's body itself becomes a nuclear bomb. Emmerich says if it were to self-destruct, the nuclear yield would be somewhere in the region of 15 kilotons. Since you need about 50 kilograms of highly enriched uranium to trigger a nuclear reaction, that would mean Sahelanthropus contains something like 23 tons of depleted uranium. That's not very much. No, it isn't. That's about what you'd expect to find in a main battle tank's armor. The point is, it can be transported anywhere, even use its conventional weaponry on the battlefield, and the international community will never suspect a thing. I just received word from the R&D team and the transport team out of Afghanistan. They finished installing Sahelanthropus on the base. It's ours now. All right. Don't let any of the staff touch that thing. Especially Emmerich. Of course. That guy's crush on Sahelanthropus is beyond a joke. Guess he really wants to see his tech stand on its own two legs this time. That's not gonna happen. I know it. So you've got no plans to make it operational again? Damn right. Boss, I want to hear it straight from you. Hear what? What the hell do you want with that thing? The drive is busted. It's not like it has a nuke on board. Even if the metallic archaea could turn it into a nuclear weapon, all it can do is self-destruct. Cephalanthropus just isn't a weapon anymore. It'll draw unwanted attention without even being a deterrent. I know. The weapon's development strut sank two feet under that thing's wake. That's one year's drop in a single night. We've started on reinforcing the strut, but there's no guarantee it'll hold up if a storm hits. I know that too. Boss, why keep it? It's a mark. Uh, us diamond dogs, we don't have a country to call home. That means we have no past, nothing to prove that we lived. Every one of us threw it all away when we came here. Sahelanthropus is a symbol to show that the likes of us brought at least one crisis to its end. A mark in history. So we can't just fade away. It's of no practical use to us. But we still need it. A symbol of what we've done. I'm glad I sounded you out on this. Snake, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you. I don't need gratitude. I need security. Keep Emmerich away from that thing. Roger that. Go, Tucker. What are the metallic archaea? Volcanic craters spewing sulfur. Water hot enough to boil your skin off. Ocean depths of 800 plus atmospheres. Wastelands radioactive enough to kill you where you stand. <sighs> there are groups of organisms that survive despite. 
No. Because of living in such environments. I've heard about them. Extremo... something. Extremo files. By selecting certain species, then subculturing and repeatedly modifying them, I created a metallic offspring of pure Archaea. They subsist on metals rather than organic matter. And some of them even consume uranium? Yes. Uranium enrichment Archaea metabolize only uranium-235. As a result, they produce weapons-grade enriched uranium. How is that possible? Consider how plants fractionate carbon isotopes when they conduct photosynthesis. Nature possesses abilities beyond our imagination. So, it was Archaea that brought down your chopper? Corrosive Archaea, yes. They oxidize metals, feeding off the energy in the electrons they receive. What became of the wreckage? We had the R&D team retrieve samples for study in... Uh, airtight plastic containers, of course. Prudent. We shall extract our chaos from it in good time. They should help you fight back against Black Anna. Any chance we could start now? It doesn't have to be a lot. I might just have another use for them. If it's only a small amount you need. That's fine. I'll get the R&D team to assist. Let's go. South Africa was previously suspected of developing nuclear weapons. It already had a conspicuous presence at the UN because of apartheid and its armed expansionism. But when neighboring Angola and Mozambique became socialist countries in 74, South Africa felt hounded into a corner. So it accelerated its nuclear program to protect itself. Three years later, the Soviets discovered a test facility. And two years after that, an American satellite observed a flash in the southern Indian Ocean. It said this was South Africa conducting a nuclear test with the help of a certain ally. Skullface used the situation in South Africa to get this ally to lend a hand. They both wanted nukes, so it was a mutually beneficial relationship. On the surface, anyway. I figure South Africa started getting serious about nuclear weapons production in 75. In 74, the government was still able to get by with bluffing that it had a nuclear arsenal. But the year after? Word spread that an independent armed group in the Caribbean was crushed by Cypher for possessing a WMD. That's right, boss. What happened to you and your men was the reason South Africa decided to push ahead with nuclear development. A force independent of any country getting its hands on a nuke. That was a threat to the existence of countries everywhere. It wasn't just South Africa. Your presence pushed a lot of countries to get nukes. The world was scared of you. You were a threat to more than just the Cold War. If nations are gears in a machine, you had the power to smash them loose and watch the whole world grind to a halt. Emmerich uses externally powered legs of his own design. It's bionics technology, a product of the US military's failed attempt to develop a powered exoskeleton. All the wearer has to do is apply a little force, and the actuators continue the movement in that direction. But his legs are unique. Instead of using a hydraulic mechanism, the actuators run off metallic archaea. That increases the actuator's reaction speed and also enables him to lock and release the joints at will. The legs are a nifty little gadget, but they have two clear weaknesses. First, they're dependent on external power, Maybe because he built them knowing he couldn't leave his lab. There's no internal battery. That's why they won't work if they aren't plugged in. Second, and this is more than just a weakness, the legs are directly connected to his bones. Could be to minimize signal loss and the order's output to the legs and the drive response from them. Either way, Emmerich has used bolts to attach load-bearing parts directly to his femurs probably by mimicking surgical treatment for compound fractures and the like. But the end result is those legs and his body are fused together. And that appears to be how he's able to move them so precisely. 
but that also means that any shock to the legs would be delivered right to his bones by way of those bolts. The same is true if he encounters the corrosive metallic archaea. If the corrosive archaea ate into the exposed bolts, they'd reach the endoskeleton parts and eat through them too in the blink of an eye. The doctor's bones are full of holes to accommodate all the bolts. They're like sponges. If he were to lose the reinforcing parts, even the tiniest bit of force or weight would snap his bones. So when I dangled those corrosive metallic archaea in front of him, he realized straight away what would happen. Life wouldn't be worth living if he lost those legs of his. I'd bet that is what the doctor fears the most. I just helped him imagine what it would be like. Thanks to that, I got the information we needed without either of us getting hurt. You know how he is. He's probably already over the shock. The better you know your adversary, the easier it is for you to get information from them. And vice versa. You said that the nuke Skullface was trying to spread around the world were equipped with a failsafe. Something that could shut them down at will. His will. Quite so. After all, he needed a guarantee that a buyer wouldn't simply turn the weapons back on him. So how can they be stopped? The criticality trigger, that is, the detonator, is a complete black box design. Any attempt to dismantle it causes it to melt in seconds, using the corroding archaea. The design ensures that no detonation is possible unless it disengages the lock. So he had a way to disengage it remotely? Precisely. The client simply presses a button. At that moment, the detonator begins transmission with a surveillance satellite. The satellite reports to him how the client is trying to use the nuke. If he does not object, the lock is disengaged. But if it's a risk to him in any way... The detonator melts down. The same is true if detonation does not occur within a preset time after the lock is disengaged. The nuke is rendered useless. Who the hell would buy something with strings attached like that? The client would never know until the moment they actually try to use it. Most likely, he would have explained the time delay as the detonator's needing time to activate. And he only intended to sell to technologically primitive groups in the first place. Let me guess. he claim it was defective and offer a replacement. Shadier than a used car salesman. Skullface shakes your hand like a friend, using the other to control you like a puppet. This is how he works. This is Yellow Cake that Cypher was having the PF's transport. Before we met you, the boss recovered it from a truck crossing the savannah. Are there metallic archaea inside it? Yes, the archaea metabolize uranium-235 to subsist. They must be stored inside Yellow Cake, or they cannot survive. So those biological traces we took for impurities were actually the real cargo? Of course they are deactivated so they do not trigger a sudden enrichment. They are like baker's yeast. Yet, they do gradually enrich the uranium as they feed. I imagine you detected weapons-grade traces. Yeah, we did. And the malachite that was loaded on the truck had traces of uranium in it, too. <laughs> so that's the flower, huh? Skullface was gonna sell do-it-yourself nuke kits. The uranium enriching Archaea complete with the user's manual. And the ores with the uranium could be sourced by the client or provided by Cypher. Even the trace amounts buried in common ores can be enriched to weapons grade uranium by the metallic Archaea. Proving that must have been the most important factor of the trials. That and the ability to successfully prevent detonation. So if the amounts of uranium in the ores are low enough, they can get past any inspection. 
and you only need a tiny amount of the Archaea to act as the yeast. No great challenge to smuggle that either. The first step towards saturating the world with nukes. His plan. That was not my intention. Hmm. <laughs> my only goal in developing the metallic Archaea was to save the Diné. What made you think a tool for creating undetectable nuclear weapons would save your people? After 70 years, the Diné reclaimed the Navajo Nation from which we were banished. We bore all the hardships of poverty. But we were proud to live off the land we called our own. But in the moment the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, everything changed. I don't get it. The nuclear arms race between the US and the Soviet Union began with the end of the Second World War. Suddenly, there was a massive demand for uranium. And it was our ill fortune that the ground beneath the Navajo Nation was rich with uranium ore. The Black Anna government set up mine after mine, and many of the Diné worked them. Never informed of any danger. Every day, they went to work with no protection. The slag was simply piled out in the open. When rain fell, uranium traces left behind would seep out, and when the ground dried, it was blown about as dust. Land and water were contaminated, irradiated. Many of us became sick and died. That pain lives on to this day. I had no idea. Wanting more than anything to revive the land my forebears left to me, I was delighted upon discovering microbes that eat uranium. If they could be domesticated, I believed we could rid our land of uranium. Were you successful? No. The research called for funding on a colossal scale. But nobody was willing to invest with no prospect of a return. And that's when Skullface showed up. Correct. I can save you and your people. We share the same will. That is what he said to me, and I believed him. Plagana forced me to abandon my uranium cleanup work and focus on nuclear weapons. And he held all the Diné hostage. Today, the uranium mines within the reservation are finally closing down. It is simply less expensive now to source uranium overseas. New victims, different places. But uranium is a tactical resource. To rely on a foreign country for it is... a difficult decision to make. And he was in the perfect place to influence that decision. He could have condemned your people to the mines forever. The contamination comes not only from uranium. The fallout from the Nevada nuclear tests also settled on our lands. As if our fortune were not already bad enough. We are also downwinders. To save the Diné, I must complete my original research. <laughs>